speaker today is Conrad Cording. He's a Penn Integrated Knowledge Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. If you don't mind, I will just read your description that you put on your website. Um, he describes himself as science coach, collaborator, and transdisciplinary optimist. So, take it away. Great. Well, thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, before I start my talk, I just want to briefly pitch something that could be relevant for a few of you. So we started this thing called Neuromatch last year. Neuromatch is a set of conferences with thousands of people in neuroscience that are all online. So for anyone who's interested in neuroscience, I highly recommend those conferences. But what we also did is we started a summer school. The summer school uh, has a unique format where people work in very small groups of 10 people with one TA each in a TA-led curriculum. So no, every, every group is with the same TA for the whole three weeks of the summer uh, school. It's very much a code fast philosophy. So uh, the way it runs is uh, you always hear five minutes from one of the experts in the area and uh, they explain something. And then for 10 minutes, people do it themselves. It is, of course, uh, so neuroscience, the summer school is mostly data science methods for neuroscientists. And this year we will also run a deep learning version of that. And for, so for anyone who wants to get into deep learning, this will be taught by many of the world's leading deep learning experts. And um, it's gonna be really, really good for learning deep learning if that is useful for some of you. And um, it's a unique format. And I think uh, last year, at least, most people judged uh, the Neuromatch Academy to be more useful than real world summer schools as they had it before the, before the pandemic. So after this, uh, this advertisement, let me first thank you for having me here. It's the first time I've ever been asked to give a talk in front of a Biostats audience. And, uh, and I'm very nervous about that. So I decided to give a bit of like an overview talk. And uh, just as an introduction, my lab very much is between neuroscience and machine learning, and more recently also causality. And that's why I so much enjoyed my afternoon, because like a lot of people uh, in your group have thought very deeply about causality, and I had just great discussions with you. Now, outline. I will first talk a little bit about how neuroscience tends to think about causality, and I think um, a lot of you have thought deeply about causality, and it's interesting to see how the way people approach it differs in different fields. Not like if you do genomics, you will have this, the causal questions in the same way as if you do neuroscience, you have causal questions. And I believe that some of the approaches might be shareable between them. And I think there's a lot of development needed there. I will then spend uh, some time on quasi experiments and uses of that in neuroscience. And um, then lastly, I will speak some about machine learning in the context of quasi experiments. I also found out that I don't have, uh, that for some reason my phone isn't here. Oh no, hold on, here, here I know what time it is, great. Um, so uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about how the concept of causality is used in neuroscience. So neuroscience as a business is ultimately after mechanism. So what neuroscientists by and large wants to, want to find out is how does the brain work in the narrow definition of how does the brain work is how do the components of the brain influence one another and how through these influences do we ultimately obtain the relationship between what goes into the brain and what comes out of the brain. Now an important part about the models is that they want to in a way they should be able to predict what would happen if we would do randomized perturbations of the brain and and this understanding of the causal chain of, uh, of stimuli that goes go into our eyes and behaviors that ultimately come out of the brain is what we in neuroscience define as mechanism. And, uh, and if you want, we would like to have that understanding, which would allow us to do, uh, to A, like have a counterfactual understanding of how things work, but also be able to understand the components. So in a lot of definitions of neuroscientists, understanding mechanism means understand the causal chain and understand the nature of the components of the causal chain that gets us there. Now also in machine learning, of course, causality is important. I know I don't need to convince you of that, but like uh, uh, in our life and in machine learning, there's arguably uh, just one purpose, which is make the world a little better for us. And um, 
that is a causal question. Like if I choose one thing versus another thing, which things are going to be most useful at making the world good in the future? And even if in machine learning we do classification, it's usually to drive a causal chain where we can say, if I detect the digits in MNIST, that's really just so that I can change the world and send the letter to the right person without having to actually require a person to read it. And I, I just want to choose uh, the better one for the future. So um, ultimately, if you talk with neuroscientists, there's a strong commitment to wanting to understand the brain as a causal system. It's the basis of reductionism. It's the basis of the way how people think about it. So let's see well, how we actually do that in neuroscience. And some of you may have heard that I'm one of the critiques about the way the neuroscience component usually does it. So there are multiple ways how neuroscientists go to establish causality. The first one is the one that we can probably all agree on, which is perturbation experiments. For example, what we can see on the left-hand side is what's called optogenetics. I take a bunch of neurons, I put a dye into that neurons that has the property that if I shine light on it, it makes those neurons extra active or inactivates it. And then what I do is I say, well, does the mouse push the button whenever I make some brain area active? Or does the, brain, does the mouse push the button faster if I have some situation? Or does the mouse learn something if we do that? And that is one of the approaches that we use to establish causality. That is, um, uh, so, so how does it work? You basically have a molecule that uh, when light is shine, uh, shined onto it, it allows ions of a certain kind to pass to the membrane. And with that, we can basically turn it on and off. And with that, we can, without any doubt, establish that a region has a causal influence on some behavior. And there's a lot of experiments. It's very popular. The next technique that we use to establish that uh, kind of effect is what's called transcranial magnetic, res uh, magnetic stimulation. How does that work? I put a coil over the head somewhere. I put a very strong pulse of current through it. The pulse of current produces like a rotational current in the brain that, if I, uh, uh, that affects a whole bunch of neurons. If I see that this affects behavior, I know that there's a causal chain between brain activity in that part of the brain and the behavior that we look at. There's also random perturbations. For example, a famous case where someone got a steel rod shot basically right through their brain and which knocked out certain parts of the brain and then they could see how behavior is different. So that's, so um, what, is, what is great about this? Not like it, it cleanly establishes causality. What is less great about it, it's very, very low dimensional. So we have a mouse or a rat that has optogenetics in some brain area. And all we can do is basically turn, turn that whole brain area on or turn that whole brain area off and see what the causal effect is of that. Uh, it's also when it comes to humans, in lots of cases, it's unethical. We can't go and just turn random parts of brain, of human brain areas off. So that's why this approach, despite the fact that it's very clean, uh, the application to humans is very limited. Um, th but there, when we have databases, say, where we take people, we look at strokes, which, which aren't quite random is a big problem, but we have strokes in different parts of the brain, and then we can correlate damage to some brain area to behavioral deficits that they have at the later point of time. Oh, hold on. And there's one more thing that I wanted to say. Please stop me whenever. You know, like if anything that I say isn't clear or if like there's something that would be interesting that you'd like to hear about, I always like being interrupted in like making this inter interactive. Okay, so the second thing that people do is they use model comparisons. They have some models that they have say two models typically that have all both been designed by humans. Maybe one model where responses in the brain are, are linearly related to responses in other brain areas. Maybe another model where they're bilinearly related to it. I say activity in some brain areas, the product of the activity in two other brain areas. Then we take these models, we fit it to data. Now, when I, when I talk fit to data, what's the nature of data that we have in your sense? We put people in MRI scanners, in which case I basically get a description of the brain in terms of 30,000 voxels. 
And what people typically do is they then go down from voxels to regions and then basically the brain with all its 10 to the 11 degrees of freedom is represented by 10 to the two brain regions. And then we have models in terms of these 10 to the two brain regions and we compare them and we ask for which model, which model provides a better fit and we choose the one that describes the data better. And our typical methods might be archaic information criterion, people use uh, deviance information criterion. There's, there's all kinds of very advanced statistical methods. Of course, uh, of, of course, we know that these techniques cannot, in that sense, establish causality. They could only establish if we could guarantee that at least one of the two models is true, which is not the case, of course, in neuroscience. No one would believe that our brain is actually bilinear. You know, like if, if, if we were like uh, that simple creatures, our thoughts wouldn't be very complicated. Then what people do is they use what could be called saturated structural equation approaches, where here's a nice paper by Jonathan Pillow, where they say they built a very complicated model for the neurons that you have. And these are usually applied not to MRI data, but for single cell data. Now, single cell data is awesome. Now, like we can put the stick electrodes into lots of individual cells. And each of these, we get a millisecond precise response. So we know exactly at which point of time each of the neuron spikes. Of course, our big problem is we do that for 100 out of a billion neurons that we have, uh, we have in the brain. But in principle, we get very, very high resolution data, which is very attractive in that sense. And then we can fit really complicated models where we can say, say uh, so this was a paper being done on the retina, where what we do is we have a visual stimulus that's basically flickering white and black dots. And these white and black dots go through a linear filter that is this fast part that we have to the left, the linear filter. Now we believe that the cells themselves have a source of noise, so noise is being added. The cell does, does integration, leaky integration. And then, whenever, and then whenever the cell's potential is above a certain value, it will emit this spike or it will probabilistically emit this spike. And then we take the spikes output, which affects the future of the cell. And it affects it in two ways. Uh, if it has spiked, it has usually what's called an absolute refractory period, which is a period after which it spiked, where it can under no circumstances spike. And then in many cases, it has oscillatory tendency. So after some period of time, it will be more likely to spike. And usually these things, uh, uh, have the structure of a generalized linear model, and we can do a maximum likelihood fit of that to what the neurons are. Now, what, um, uh, what's necessary for that? Now, like we need to make assumptions about causal sufficiency. We need to make assumptions of having the correct functional form. And there's recently been a lot of papers that say, even if we would record all neurons, which we never do, like because the brain has 10 to the 11, we, we will usually, if we are lucky if we have 1,000 cells at a time. And like, I'm trying to give you a bit of feeling about the scales that we have there. So we have, uh, we have 1,000 neurons at a time out of a pool of billions. And uh, we can then fit these models to that. And then we will often interpret them as if it tells us causality within the system. But of course, these assumptions cause a sufficiently in the correct functional forms uh, why, uh, they are usually hard, very hard to justify because in reality, we know preciously little about how the actual functional form of the neurons look like. In any case, I'm trying to give you a, a feeling for like the different strands within your science. So when it comes to people that fit these in the spike community and people who put needles into brains, electrodes into a brain, this is a very popular technique for people you use fMRI they, they often rather like fit techniques like range of causality or what they call dynamic causal modeling to it. Now, there's a lot of neuroscientists that recently cite Judia Pearl, uh, which is a very good point to make. It's just that they, that they don't actually read Judia Pearl. So they, they, they assume then uh, that we have unconfoundedness. And then under those assumptions where all variables are recorded, you can maybe under certain circumstances infer what the causality is here. So usually when a neuroscientist uh, 
cites Judea Paul, it means that they assume unconfoundedness, which Judea Paul most certainly doesn't approve of. But it is this, uh, this, this, this strong tendency. And I'm trying to just like give you a little bit the feeling of like the various branches of neuroscience and how they approach those points. Now, let me also briefly highlight how causality often feels like in machine learning, at least at, at NeuroApps and the other machine learning conferences that, that I go to. In most cases, uh, it is ignored, where, where you fit a machine learning system and you treat it as if it provides causal insights. And, uh, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of versions of that. Um, uh, machine learning people today very much read Judy at Paul but they very much don't read the consideration about confounders that immediately come once you actually read Julia Paul. And um, I should mention a lot of people probably heard about David Bly's deconfounder. It was very popular in machine learning for a little bit. It assumes that all confounders are independent of one another. And it assumes uh, that uh, every confounder affects at least two of the observed variables. And under those assumptions, if, if confounders are really independent of one another and affect at least two variables at a time, then it is possible to indeed do something about them. And, um, but in general, of course, causality is hard and we can only do it when we really know something about the world. And I just want to make sure that this is clear. Now, I want to dive a little bit into the notion of causality in neuroscience and why it's uh, why it's so hard and in general about the notion of causality in big complex systems so like we i believe we all agree on the definition of causality let a and b be events causation if this exists if we had changed a to a new star the probability of b would have been different uh, standard causal uh, standard counterfactual definition of causality now in a uh, machine learning um, there's a continuum of confounding. And like there's cases where there's like clearly no confounders. If I play Go, and in fact, all the things that we're really good at machine learning are cases where we don't have confounding. If we play Go, there's no confounding. You know? Like we both look at exactly the same bot and whatever goes on in your head is like, it's not of deeper interest for me because everything is separated by the bot that's between us that tells us the full state. And similarly, if we look at Atari games or ImageNet, arguably there's no meaningful confounding in those data sets. Now there are cases in machine learning where there's a little bit of confounding, let's say StarCraft. You, you don't see the whole board, you only see what your units actually see at a given point of time. And so there's some of them. And then of course, the domain where, where a lot of us like have to live in, which is like medicine. In medicine, lots of things are confounded. And we have typically very many of them. And then of course in neuroscience, we arguably have about 10 to the 11 confounders. Now we have 10 to the 11 neurons. They all do something at roughly the one millisecond scale. They all interact with one another at that scale. But, um, uh, but uh, we don't observe all of them apart from a finite number. And uh, apart from a small number, and that number is like 100 or maybe it's a thousand. So that number is, is really, really very small. Now you could say in a way neuroscience feels easy if you come from other disciplines because it has this super good temporal resolution potentially, but it has this massively unobserved component which makes neuroscience much harder. So I want to give you an, an intuition on, on why it fe always feels that correlation is causation and why correlation and causation are actually very different. So let's take the most trivial uh, a dynamical system. Now, like we have here, xt plus one is sigma, where sigma is some nonlinear function of a xt plus epsilon. I can remove sigma. It, everything on the next few slides will look exactly the same. Okay, so now x is the dynamical system that we're setting up. It's it's just a simple dynamical system. Uh, a is the, is the causal ground truth matrix. Now, A is how causally every neuron affects every other neuron. Or like this thing doesn't need to be about neuroscience. Now, this thing could just as well be about the dynamics of molecules in some cells that will, it will have the same general property. But A basically says how each component affects each of the other components. And then just for simplicity, epsilon t is random noise. Now, in like in the if if we remove sigma, then we can do 
mathematically describe this in all kinds of ways. Now, just to, to already give you the gist of what's gonna happen, I will show that in small systems, for such systems, correlation is very much causation. And then in large systems, like those that we have in neuroscience, correlation and causation are radically different. And this is something that I didn't have when I was a student. I didn't have a good intuition for that at all. Okay, so, so everyone with me, here we have a super simple dynamical system. And what we will ask is, can we recover how, the, how that system works? Okay, and, and we will use the kinds of techniques that neuroscientists use for that. No, and so, so, so how, how, how would we use correlations to get it? it well, uh, no, here we have like how xt relates to xt plus one. And therefore we expect that the time delay one correlation should be somewhat similar to A. And so let's simulate that for a very small system. So what we have here on the right-hand side, so we have that matrix, uh, matrix A. So this is the actual true connectivity matrix. And then we look at the time delayed correlation and look, the two of them are very, very similar. Now that makes a lot of sense if we think about it. That is, if we think about causality, we are always in our heads thinking about these very small systems. We have like five variables of one another because like, if I'm honest, I can't like think of higher than five dimensional, maybe higher than three dimensional system. But in these simple systems, correlation and causation are actually very, very similar to one another. Now, is this a general property? Like, what if this system was bigger? And like, I can have the same dynamics in just a bigger system. So now we go from five dimensional to 100 dimensions. Um, on the left-hand side, we see the true connectivity matrix chosen to be, uh, to be, bin uh, to be binary here. And uh, on the right-hand side, we have the estimated connectivity matrix. What you can see here is now these two are really almost completely different from one another. Why is, that, why is this happening? I'm curious who of you has like a clear intuition for why this is happening. Now, so, so, so let's go through why it's happening. Every neuron, every element in this dynamical system adds a tiny bit of noise every time step. But such a system will have some large singular values. These large singular values will basically add up all the noise from all the many, many neurons. So while a small system, every neuron generates its own noise, which like quickly gets removed from the system, a really big system very much has its own dynamics. And by virtue of it having its own dynamics, you don't learn about the connections, you learn about the basic dynamical uh, the dimensions of the dynamics of the system. We can then analyze how that, uh, how that scales. So what we have here is you take the, the, the causal matrix A and the delayed correlation matrix R, you vectorize them, you just take the scalar product of them. And that correlation is what we have on the y-axis here and, on the and the number of neurons is what we have on the x-axis. And as error bars, you, you have the 95% uh, 95, uh, 95 distribution and we just do it 100 times and like basically throw away the top and the bottom of that. And what you can see is as the number goes up, the correlation goes down very quickly. And now why does that matter? Now like this is a trivial dynamical system. It's not very interesting if you think about it. But the reason why it matters, it gives us an intuition on why we are so wrong as neuroscientists. We think about these simple system and we're like, yeah, when that, one, that neuron spikes, it makes that other neuron spike. And like, yeah, we should see that, that like should be the right way of thinking about it. But we don't have this intuition, oh, like, but there's a background of a million other neurons that like do things and kind of these dynamics of these million neurons ultimately drowns out what we are actually interested in. And so that's why I really like going through this example because it just highlights why our human intuitions about causality may often be so wrong. Um, I wonder if I can ask a question just uh, quickly about the slide. And I wonder, to what extent this phenomenon depends on the sparsity of the connectivity in the system? Yes, it does somewhat depend on the sparsity. I had a slide at some point of time where we analyzed that the dependence on, this, uh, on, the, on the sparsity, and, and I think you can have an intuition on the dependency on the sparsity. You know, like if the system is very, very sparse, 
And then Yon therefore basically has almost no inputs who also almost have no inputs. In that case, uh, that effect kind of doesn't exist anymore. But like to the level that like the system, no, like basically if the, if the covariance matrix has no structure apart from like the immediate time dependency. Now, like, but if you look at the auto, uh, uh, at the covariance matrix between the different neurons, if that one has no structure, almost no structure, correlation is causation. If that thing has strong structure, then cause they, correlation and causation become decoupled from one another. But it's, it's, it's hard to construct systems that, that have very little structure unless you make it extremely, extremely sparse. But that's a fantastic question. No, like it's, it's, it, it is important. But if you, if you like double the sparseness or tenfold the sparseness, it, it, it makes remarkably small differences here. A great question, thank you. Um, cool, no, and like then, uh, then, then let's make that a little quantitative about why, why neuroscience then is difficult. No, like we can look at the omitted, omitted variable bias equation where, oh, and by the way, I don't see the chat. So if someone asks a question on chat, please someone translate that to me in words. It's, there's just no chat window for some reason on my screen. Um, let's look at the omitted variable bias equation uh, where you can say uh, in, uh, when we're interested in causality, what we often do is we do regressions and, um, and we can then, and in fact, all the machine learning techniques are just glorified methods of doing regression if we, if we think about this as a, at a higher level, where, where we have variables that we're interested in, what's the causal effect of the X on the Y that we parameterize with beta, but there's other variables Z that we don't measure and they will have some effect delta and then there's noise UI on it. And then we can, we can use this, uh, uh, use the omitted variable bias equation to basically say that the, the, that the ex expected value that we get is the true causal effect plus this bias term. And if we look at the bias term, it has this first component, the X prime X inverse, which is basically the same component that also shows up in the main effect. Now, like uh, the, the, beta, uh, the beta shows up by multiplying the, the autocorrelation here, the X prime X uh, minus uh, to the power of minus one with the X prime Y. Uh, now we have an extra term where basically it has this with x prime z. Now like, and the delta. Now the delta, the correlation between pairs of neurons, random pairs of neurons in the brain, is usually in the 0 0.1, 0 0.3 range. The first term, beta, the true causal effects between the 100 dimensions that we actually measure, is, uh, uh, is going to be of the same order of magnitude as that delta effect. But the second term has the same structural components, including the same autocorrelation. And, um, and yet there are 10 to the 11 terms here and only 10 to the two terms in the first part. And therefore we should strongly expect that the second part, the bias that we have, arbitrarily strongly outweighs the first part. And there's no intrinsic way of making this effect go away. So all the machine learning techniques will not make the nature of the second term uh, um, go away. And you can convince yourself that this is generally the case by writing about. Okay, and, uh, and, and just as a reminder, like the typical neuron-neuron correlations are of the 0 0.1, 0 0.3 range, if you look at the cohen cohen paper. Um, now, now let, let me make a little bit of a comments of differences across fields. Fields. Now, like when it comes to causal inference, as we see it from a neuroscience perspective, there's different corners. Now, there are parts of causal inference who very strongly demand that there should be no bias under any circumstances. Um, the omitted variable bias equation in some cases might convince us that biases are small. Now, like if if I have if you give me a list of confounders. And you also tell me how strongly these confounders are correlated with the variables of interest to me. I can give you upper bounds on how strongly it could be, uh, could bias us. And then there's other fields like certain corners of neuroscience that basically just assume that unconfoundedness and uh, faithlessness, uh, faithfulness is given. And if they're given, then things are good. It's just in practice, they're often not. But in most cases, at least in neuroscience, uh, biases will be really, really very big. Now that gets me to 
my excitement about quasi experiment and i should say we put together a nice uh, a nice notebook that contains all kinds of ways of like playing with quasi experiments um i'll be happy to share that later in chat if you want that that uh, that, uh, that has that now then like there exist pure observational studies where uh, we might not have hopes that we can get rid of all the potential confounders there are experiments where we randomize things, where we have good causal validity, good reasons to assume that we're on the right, uh, right path. And then quasi-experiments are basically about finding something in the real world that approximates randomness. And I know some of you have thought a lot about that. Uh, we have recently written two review papers uh, that highlight how they can be useful for neuroscience and also for machine learning. So, um, so and, and just, uh, for people who really like Julia Paul, it's very easy to use Paul syntax to prove that the quasi experiments are all correct quasi, uh, correct identification strategies. They just rely the, on the assumptions about the models to ultimately be correct. Now, uh, let me now spend a little bit of time to talk about regression discontinuity approaches for people who've heard a lot about this. This might be a very simple repetitions of things you've already seen before, but bear with me, I will hopefully say a few interesting things about it. So uh, let's say we have, a, in a typical regression discontinuity case, we might have an exam score. Above a certain exam score, you get a treatment. In this case, the treatment is you get a certificate of merit, which apparently is, uh, is a thing in America. And it basically just says, you're an awesome student. And you can show everyone on your CV, I'm like an awesome student. And if you're below the threshold, you can't. And now you can say from Ruben's, uh, 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 Ruben's uh, outcomes framework, we can say there is uh, one which I sketch here in green, which would, what, what would happen if we would just give every person that certificate of merit. And of course, like future achievement might be higher because you can go to people and say, hey, I'm certified awesome. And, uh, and alternatively, there could be a different curve that also depends on the exam scores uh, where uh, no one gets it. And, uh, and we, I plotted them here as the green and the, uh, and the red curve. Now, of course, on the right-hand side of the threshold, I will only observe the green curve. And on the left-hand side of that curve, I will only observe the red curve. And under certain circumstances, namely no cheating and a few other conditions, um, I will have like a correct estimate of the causal effect of what we have there, which is called the local average treatment effect. And uh, that's the nature of, uh, of, the, of the regression discontinuity design. And, um, and again, there's, this, there's a whole host of conditions under which you can prove that this is correct, at least as you make, as you, uh, as you focus on people that are close to the threshold. Here's a classical paper that did that, the Thistle, Waite and Campbell paper. What do you do is you take the people to the left of the threshold, you fit a linear function to that, you focus only on the on people that are close to the threshold. And um, then, uh, and you have, uh, the, just to be clear what's on the graph here, on the x axis, we have the score that you have. Above 10 is where you get the certificate of merit. On the y axis, you have the percent of students that wins a scholarship. Look how nice the world back then was. Half of the students got scholarships afterwards. And uh, you have two different kinds of uh, scholarships. The upper, uh, the upper things that is, is denoted with G and G prime uh, are getting any scholarship. And the lower ones that are denoted with H are getting a big scholarship. And in both cases, we see that there's a discontinuity around 10 and uh, it's being chalked up in this case to the causal effect of actually having that on your CV. Like, hey, I got the national certificate of merit. And uh, the, the econometrics of this is very simple. You basically just fit linear, uh, a linear function to the left, a linear function to the right. And in the time since the Thistle, Waite, and Campbell, of course, we had a lot of improvements of the methods. Now we, we have like a Gaussian process now for fitting. We have, uh, we, we, we have all kinds of ways of doing this better. We have a lot of techniques to select uh, 
which data ponds should we contain? And like ultimately most real world data sets, they're non-linear, but they will be linear as long as we focus on the real vicinity of the threshold. And there's a lot of cool methods development in that area. In any case, more modern applications. Uh, there's a wonderful Angus paper from 97 on class sizes. There's a rule by uh, the sage Maimonides from the 12th century, which says that no class should have more than 40 students. I very much agree with him. And Israel made that official policy. And then we can use the methods of the regression discontinuity methods to show that indeed it is good for kids to go into a smaller class where they will hopefully learn more. There's also a lot of sanity checks. We can detect if there's cheating. No? Like imagine that rich people um, have a mechanism if they get below the threshold to retake the test. Or maybe the teachers cheat and move them a little bit. In such cases, the assumptions would be wrong. Our causal effects would in fact be biased. And we can fortunately look at that by say, asking is there discontinuity at the threshold and there's of course the fuzzy rdd where we can say well what if like the treatment isn't just at one place but it is somewhat distributed uh, it leads to effectively instrumental variables being used for this i should also mention regression discontinuities uh, require a lot of data uh, why because they have a, uh, the variance is factor three higher just because of the geometry of that because we have the extra parameters now, like what we'd want to ask is if we can bring these techniques, say, to medical applications, and uh, how much observational data would we need relative to what we would need to run the RCT. And uh, we have this factor three there. The sigma squared is, of course, shared with the, uh, with the RCT. But then we also have, instead of dividing by the number n of overall samples, we have the number n that is in the bandwidth. So we can only use items that are close enough to the threshold. And moreover, if we don't have full compliance, if like we have some subset that will not do what we tell them, which basically maybe we have some people that will always get the certificate of merit or, or some people who will never get it, for example, because they don't live in America. And if we don't know these things, then we have like this extra factor of one over P squared, in, uh, one of P squared where P is the ratio of people who get treated. Now, the first thing, there, there's some interesting things that we can do with these, uh, with, with these that I believe haven't been done before. The first one is there's an obvious optimization problem. And let's say there's a threshold. I have a treatment at that threshold. The, that could, for example, be it's a drug. I give the drug to everyone who's maybe above some weight or above some blood pressure or something like that. And I observe the data on the right-hand side and the and data on the left-hand side. Now, under certain semi-harmless assumption, we can then say, can we say something about how we should change that threshold? Now, you could traditionally you can say, well, it helps if the, the causal effect is positive at the margin, the, uh, the, uh, the local average treatment effect has a is positive in that area. But what we want to do is treat it as an optimization problem. How much can we move the threshold so that we optimize things. So here's a fun application of that. Uh, I'm sure you've sat in taxis and um, they have two different modes. They either tell you, do you want to tip one, two or three dollars if your fee is very small? Or they ask you, do you want to tip 15% or 20% or 25%? And of course, for large fees, that's really big. For small fees, like one, two, three dollars might be really big. What they, what that specific taxi company that has the data public had is a threshold at 15. And uh, if we try and run our optimization, and, and there's multiple ways of optimizing. Now you can say, I want to move it so that my expected value is maximized, or I want to move the threshold so that the chance that I'm I move it too far is minimized, which is something you'd use in a medical case. But in any case, in both cases, we can now use these techniques. Of course, we now need assumptions about like smoothness of functions. And, but under those, uh, those assumptions, we can treat this as an optimization uh, problem. I should mention you can use the Gaussian process version of that as well. I should also say we've been building models of how brain cells do things. Now, a cell spikes. Now, a cell spikes if its activity is above some threshold. And if it's below that threshold, it will not spike which is exactly a discontinuity in the output. Now there's lots of models of brains 
where cells in a way need to estimate what their causal effect is. Now, I'm a cell, I wanna optimize myself. I wanna like help that animal that I'm in be as successful as possible. Now you can say, I can take cases where I almost spike and it was good for the animal or where I, I just barely spiked and it was good for the animal. And I can optimize my properties based on that. It is, um, it is considerably more efficient than if we simple-mindedly ignore that and uh, basically look for correlations instead. Um, good, so I, we have very little time. So let me tell you about something where I think machine learning and, uh, and regression discontinuity can meaningfully inform one another. So, um, so, so what if instead of calculating the local average treatment effect, we would uh, calculate the local average treatment effect on likely compliers? Well, why is this attractive? Now, like we usually have in the in real world data sets, we have a certain subpopulation that will basically not care about our threshold. So we've been working on diabetes a lot. There's guidelines that say above a certain value, they should consider you diabetic and give you a very different treatment than if you're below that threshold. And guess what, which proportion of doctors actually, like which proportion, how big is that discontinuity in the treatment? Now, lots of people before that threshold already get treated for diabetes. Lots of people above that threshold still don't get treated, but we have a discontinuity. And now, why is this a problem? Well, the reason why this is a problem is we have lots of non-compliers on both sides of the threshold. They all contribute noise, and therefore we will very, be very poorly powered in those situations. And you saw that there's the one minus p squared component in the variance. So this basically blows up the variance of our estimator and uh, therefore makes it very hard to see any effects. So what if we could, what if we could have a machine learning oracle? I ask it, hey, is that is this person going to be compliant if to what's going to happen? And the oracle could perfectly tell us who that is. Well, in that case, we would have a hard, uh, instead of this fuzzy RDD that we have now, we would have a hard RDD and we would be powered much better to do things. And so the idea is what we want to build towards, and I will not be able to show you application results of that, just the calculations of that, is uh, we can uh, calculate the, uh, the, the, uh, the basically who's going to be a complier and then we can use machine learning to basically estimate the effect on non uh, on on likely compliers and uh, that should give us more statistical power so we simulate simple data when we have an outcome that's an effect times the treatment uh, variable times it and we will also have a trend and a running variable because we always have them in these conditions with some noise and then we can assume in, in a first case, so this is the trivial case. Um, uh, we have compliers and we have non-compliers and it's perfectly observable who's a complier. And um, uh, let's look at the brown graph there. The brown graph is if half of people are compliers. If we don't know that uh, half of people are compliers and we do, uh, and uh, we do, uh, then we will have very, very low power. Why do we have such low power? because basically the bulk of the data that we have is not indicative about any effect. And so what we see with RDD is almost nothing. And then the more units we exclude, the better we get until we basically have excluded all the non-compliers at which point of time we will start excluding compliers and then our power goes down because we have a smaller and smaller population. And then you can say, what if we make it probabilistic? The probability that a given person is a complier depends, uh, uh, is different for every person, and we observe that. And then you can say that excluding just the right number of people gives us a maximum in, uh, maximum in power. And you can see that in many cases, the effect is considerable for the power that we have here. And then we can say, well, what if we now use machine learning? Does it introduce biases? No, it doesn't, and you can easily show that. And then you can say, what is the power benefit? Now, let me be clear here. The alternative is basically using two, uh, two, uh, uh, two stagely squared, uh, squares uh, in, an, uh, in an instrumental variable setting. And uh, what we find is that uh, data-driven uh, two stagely squares where we can actually throw away the right non-compliers give us considerably more power. And right now we are working on applying it to large data sets. Mostly we're focusing on diabetes. Now it is, 
420, so I should wrap things up. I, I briefly want to plug something that I think is important on the machine learning side, and I imagine that a lot of you will have to deal with machine learning at the moment. Um, machine learning often gives people the flavor that you need to know a lot about machine learning to do good machine learning. And it turns out that automatic machine learning has gotten extremely good. Now, what's an automatic machine learning? Automatic machine learning doesn't take one technique that you're really good at, but takes all of them. And it runs them for all the meaningful hyperparameter settings and puts it all together. And it turns out that in lots of uh, cases, in almost all cases, it does better than my PhD students. And, uh, in, and that is not because my, my PhD students don't know how to do machine learning. And, uh, and let me just show you two, uh, two examples. We applied it on our own techniques where we do relationship prediction. That's joint work with Lyle Unger and Tony Leo. Um, uh, auto escalon simply does better than the simpler methods. We also applied it on liquid biopsies. The cool thing about the liquid biopsies data set is we know how good the published papers are. So we don't, we, we don't tune any parameters. We just take the published data sets and the published, uh, published AUC area under the curve. And uh, we then see how good they are. And on the x-axis here, you see the literature reported AUC. On the y-axis, you see what automatic machine learning AUC does. You can see that it generally does better. And it gets even better, which is if as a community, we agree that we should have AutoML do the machine learning for us, then AutoML can learn which kind of problems are best solved by which methods, which buys as an extra benefit is what we see on the left hand, on the right hand side, vanilla automatic machine learning on the x-axis, but like, look, it's all about bi liquid biopsy. So the algorithm after having run on like 20 liquid biopsy set basically knows something about like what works in liquid biopsies and you get conditional, uh, you get considerable extra mileage out of that. So everyone getting into machine learning, I highly recommend looking into automatic, into automatic machine learning techniques. Now, I want to now like jump right to my conclusion sentence, uh, slide. And I'm sorry that I didn't get through more of that. So I think, I think it's important to realize how like many different communities these days really strive for causality. And, um, and I think it's important to also realize that there are lots of cases where we cannot deliver on causality. And that's okay. It's, it's just a real property and something that we can say something about. But by just pretending it doesn't exist, we don't make it go away. No? Like It's like people use correlational techniques and then and then in their discussion sections, they still talk about causal effects. So it's 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 not by by it's it's it doesn't help us if we just assume that the problem doesn't exist. No, like the world wants us to give them causal estimates, and we need to like tell them if our estimates are actually causal or if they're not. Um, uh, I think quasi experiments are a set of important ideas. I also think that this combination between causal techniques and machine learning is severely underexplored. So. Machine learning techniques are very good at dealing with high dimensional data sets. In fact, like they, they have just the kinds of biases that work really well there. Causality techniques are almost always underpowered. So that combination of machine learning to increase power, for example, by automatic exclusion, as I, as I told you a little bit about, but also by say, taking methods of modeling the data and, extra and removing variants that just adds noise to our outputs also promises to increase the power. And with that, I, I just want to thank you so much for having me as a neuroscientist give a, a biostatistics talk. Thank you. Thanks, we can open it up to questions. I think there was one in the chat that we missed. Uh, know if Cenka is still here. Uh, yeah, so Cenka asked, uh, is the same phenomenon also observed for linear Gaussian systems? I'm not sure, like it was a linear Gaussian system that I was talking about. Uh, so yes, it, it, the same phenomenon should be observed there. I, I must. I, I may miss miss something about the question about the background. I'm, I'm. I'm not. I don't know when it was asked, but the system I was simulating was a linear Gaussian system that just had. 
Uh, oh yeah, yeah, hold on, no, no. I had like that sigma there, but like, yes, the results look exactly the same for the linear Gaussian system as the slightly nonlinear system that I had, but it's a very good question. No, and that's because the effect is not coming from the nonlinearity. The effect is coming from the, from the fact that the, that large systems produce their own dynamics and those dynamics then start dominating over other uh, over the self-generated noise. I had a question when you were talking about um, using machine learning to identify compliers and non-compliers and exclude your non-compliers. Is what is the notion of a non-complier for a neuron? I, I, I have never thought about using the technique for a neuron, but okay, no, 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 let, let, let me highlight here. So uh, for example, there are some neurons for, that have a very hard threshold. So basically if they're at plus 20 millivolts, they will not spike at plus 22 millivolts, they will spike. There are some other neurons where Spiking or not spiking depends on other factors much more. And that could be the activity of nearby neurons. So there is this effect that if you have a DC electrical field in the vicinity of a neuron, it has, it has somewhat of an influence on the neuron's activity. There's also aspects where the dynamics of a neuron has an influence. There are neurons that just are like very, very nonlinear. So there are neurons for which probably kind of this approximation breaks down, right? It's basically, for a neon, I cannot predict that it just almost spiked. I can, I'm basically bad at predicting at that. And then for those neons, arguably, I might not even want to look at it. Or I, I, would, want, I would not want to trust them. So yeah, good, good question. I never made that link. Great. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Uh, thanks so much for having me there. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for speaking and um, have a good rest of your day. <laughs> Great. Likewise. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.